as someone that came from the UK where as a, as a teenage bird nerd I dreamed of uh, seeing birds like chestnut-sided warblers and red-eyed vireos that would very occasionally make it across the Atlantic to the UK and there's still a little part of me that always gets a thrill when I see these, these birds. One of the coolest moments with chestnut-sided warblers was one fall when I actually had seven chestnut-sided warblers all at the same time bathing in the pond that was, um, that was pretty incredible. Hi, my name's uh, Richard Hall. I've been uh, here in Athens um, since 2009. I'm an assistant professor in the Odom School of Ecology. Um, lived in this particular house for about, for about 10 years now. When we bought this house, the yard was uh, completely full of uh, bamboo, wisteria, English ivy, uh, a list of invasives you're probably quite familiar with. Uh, but I was struck by, we, we have these very tall water oaks and they have this cathedral-like effect that struck me as um, looking like it could potentially attract birds. I decided to plant mostly, uh, almost entirely native plants. been a bunch of um, scientific studies saying that uh, native plants can provide great resources for pollinators both as larval food plants um, and as sources of nectar um, and if you've got lots of insects that's really great for the insectivorous birds as well and recent studies have shown that um, the proportion of native uh, vegetation in your yard uh, as that increases the better the nesting success of insectivorous birds. I've been a lifelong bird nerd and I, um, I just love the idea of um, having all this wildlife um, around in the, in the yard. To start small and build from there, uh, the front yard used to be um, almost entirely lawn and now it's just a pollinator meadow. And I wasn't sure, you know, we all grew up with lawns and I wasn't sure how, if I was going to feel comfortable without having that feature at all in the yard. But um, I just gradually shrank it sort of bit by bit um, and that, that helped me sort of get in my comfort zone and now it's gone, I don't, uh, I don't miss it at all. It's full of wildlife and I never have to mow. So one thing you might notice about my yard is it's, uh, it's not particularly manicured. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's got a pretty uh, over, overgrown look, uh, which, which, I, which I absolutely love. Wildlife really appreciates, uh, you know, the birds that use your yard and pollinators also um, appreciate little kind of refuges, um, areas that they can hide from um, predators. It's important to do things like when, you're, when your plants have finished flowering, leave the seed heads so the goldfinches can actually um, enjoy these for a while. When, when the plants die back in the winter, leave at least some of the stems there because so many uh, solitary bees and other insects will overwinter or make nests in them the, the, the following year. And similarly, leaf litter uh, is a really great place for invertebrates to hide during the winter and all your sparrows and toes will be flipping up those leaves and looking for those um, critters through the winter. It provides food for them throughout the winter. I've learned about the importance of trying to plan for uh, flowering resources to, to maximize the duration of flowering resources in a, in a season. So from the azaleas hitting in um, early March through to things like uh, Georgia Aster and Swamp Sunflower that bloom through November. I've learned a lot about the, um, the phenology or the, or the timing of, of when uh, nectar resources and, and flowers and their, and their seeds are available for insects and birds.
Luckily for us here in Athens, we have the State Botanical Gardens right down the road and they have their Centre for Native Plant Studies which does a native plant sale every fall. They also have a, a smaller selection of native plants available at their spring sales uh, also. So right here we have uh, a research site where these, these plants are not only native to this region but also kind of cultivated locally as well. Um, so genetically similar to wild plants that you might you might see around and then um, another place I, I really love to go is Beach Hollow Farm um, which is just north of uh, Lexington and I've got many of my native plants from, from there. When we have this built uh, I asked for this little uh, custom hatch to be put in and that way I have this view where I can see directly down the, the stream of the, of, of the pond and that's where all the uh, all the birds come in. I've also got a view of that plum leaf azalea and cardinal flowers that the hummingbirds have been uh, all over this summer. So um, one, of, one of the great things about, about putting in a pond is it's kind of revealed exactly how many people, uh, how many birds are passing through this, this pretty urban neighborhood. And um, today I've recorded uh, just over 130 species uh, in the spring and the fall I can record 60 species days and um, that's included about 30 species of warbler, all of which that have, um, have come into bathe here. If you want to attract down some of those um, harder to see birds, things like migratory warblers that can often be really high in the canopy and difficult to see, um, this is a great, a great way to attract them to, to, to your yard. And really any it doesn't, it doesn't have to be as fancy as a, as a kind of moving stream. Any, any body of water will work, but if you do have a way to keep the water moving, uh, that achieves a couple of things. One, it will help keep mosquitoes from breeding in it. And two, I actually think the, the sound and the dappled light of the reflections of the water actually uh, attract uh, birds even more. And this, this little stream area here is pretty shallow, and all sorts of birds have uh, come in to drink here from red-shouldered hawks down to ruby crown kinglets. here in Athens to have our own um, uh, Audubon chapter, the Oconee Rivers Audubon Society, and that was really integral for me when I when I first arrived here from the from the UK. Um, it was great to um, help form a community of um, of birders. Um, I also learned a huge amount from the experienced birders that were part of that organisation by participating in their in their bird walks. After a few years of being here, I, I joined their board and was. Um, president of the Audubon Society for a couple of years and um, now I'm just a, a, a board member at large. Um, it's been really great over the, the last several years to be involved in various uh, conservation and outreach programs that Oconee Audubon has sponsored. A couple of recent ones that I was really excited to participate in included um, a canebrake restoration at the State Botanical Gardens um, and another this uh, summer was the uh, Binoculars for Young Black birders uh, initiative that uh, some graduate students at UGA initiated the idea and Oconee Rivers Audubon was really happy to help um, coordinate that event. Those kind of moments, the first, the first scarlet tanager of the of the spring that shows up and bathes here, and is just, you know, blows you away with how colourful it is. Uh, I, I love those moments during spring and fall migration when you never really know what's going to land right in front of you. <laughs> 